Hey guys, my name is Jason with Mount Baker Mining and Metals, and on today's video, we're going to be processing some rocks I collected from a mine in Eastern Oregon through the equipment behind me to determine how much gold and silver is in these rocks, how much money, how much value we have here. And for those of you who haven't seen part one or are maybe new to the channel, I'm going to put that part one right after this clip. For those of you who have seen it or want to skip right ahead to seeing how much gold we have in our rocks, I'm going to leave a timestamp right up here so you guys can skip ahead. Hey everyone, my name is Jason with Mount Baker Mining and Metals, and today we're in Eastern Oregon. Going to do a little prospecting, go explore some underground mines, and get a big sample of stuff that we're going to take back to my shop, crush it up, and see if we can get the gold out. Right now we're standing on the big dump pile, and you can see the trucks there. It's a quite, it was quite an operation back in the day. But what we're going to be looking for, I'm going to try and get a sample of some of this quartz here. These were quartz veins they were mining. And it's laying all over the dumps here. Probably lower grade stuff since they kicked it off into the dumps. But it's easy pickings. And I figure we can get maybe three, four, five hundred pounds and get it run through the crusher. But you can see there's some oxidation here. Some pyrite in there. So maybe not everything on the dump is bad. But we'll get a big enough sample to see what we can find in this stuff. But they, they mined thousands and thousands of tons out of here. These workings are pretty much vertical. They're back up over here somewhere. We're going to try and get in them today. And the vein's running kind of east-west here and dips pretty much straight down. So hopefully we can get, get down in there and do a little exploring today. Well, I'm here with the owner today, and he said that this was actually a spot where the ore bin was, the old ore bin. And rather than pick around in the dumps, he said, you know, just come on over here and there's a bunch of ore that they thought was good enough to, to send. But here a couple of years ago, there was a big fire that came through and it burned the ore bin up. There's old charred logs and stuff, a little bit that's left over. But all the ore just came down and sat in a pile. So I'm going to grab up most of our sample from here and... That should be better than just the stuff in the dumps. Well, I've collected about five bags of material off this little scree here under where the ore bin was. And I've collected most of the bigger pieces, baseball size or bigger, but there's this big pile of finds right here. And I can kind of envision the ore bin was up there. They would come and they dump the ore carts into the ore bin. That's long since burned, but right here, was probably the chute where they would fill up cars and send them down to the valley bottom. So all these fines are just a bunch of ore, the fines out of the ore bin that they missed or spilled. So I'm gonna grab a couple bags of these fines and see what those look like through the crusher. I always think when I'm out at mine sites like this and I see all this ore laying on the ground, somebody worked really, really hard to get that rock mined from underground up on the surface and then down to the mill. And this was all wasted effort. It got all the way out here and then they, it got dumped in the ground and that was it. So now I'm kind of reaping the benefits of all their work by all I got to do is just shovel this stuff up, put it in sandbags and send it into the crusher. So thanks old timers for mining this stuff for me. I got my little mining project done there. Got three sandbags worth. Now I got to get them up that hill to the truck. They look fun, but after 10 trips up that hill, it's wearing on you. I don't know if you can tell on camera, but right above those pyrite cubes, there's a bunch of free gold in the quartz. So that's something we found off one of the dumps here. So there's, there is some nice gold in this stuff. 
talk yeah, just with you, talk with you. Yeah, just maybe give us a little bit of the history on this place and and what they were doing and looking for. And this uh, this mine was first developed in about the 1880s, 1890, and was worked up until the uh, the early 1900s. And I suspect it's there's no official data to support it, but there was probably about 10,000 ounces of gold came out of here. Um, it's basically free milling gold within a quartz veins that have minor sulfides in the form of chalcopyrite, galena, and pyrite. The shaft that you're looking at supposedly goes down about 300 feet straight down with levels probably about every 100 feet. Wow and uh it's collapsed in but uh this is the main shaft where they were pulling everything up right this was probably the haulage uh, way that they brought the ore out of and then uh, there was a cable uh, tramway down to the city of which is about a mile away and they processed the ore at that point but they would tram it down there and then had, uh, I think, a 10-stamp mill. Oh, okay. Or some fairly small mill that would mill it. And this is the, here's the vein over here you can kind of see. Looks like there's two or three sub-parallel quartz veins, and at least from the exposures here, they're from one to three feet wide. And they shafted down, and down under there in the workings, there's stopes that they would mine the ore out of. And it'd come up in a skip or a bucket here, right to the the ore bin, where, where I was collecting samples earlier. And then they'd send it down to get milled. And it was it was a stamp mill with uh, copper plates and mercury, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, how are we going to get in there? <laughs> feet, feet first. Is there? Is there? Never go head first. Is there? Is there some stairs or an elevator mm -hmm. or something? <laughs> There's just one landing at the bottom. Uh -huh. uh, there are a series of uh, uh, stopes and uh, uh, some other workings on another uh, parallel vein that we're, we're going to go to right now. Uh, but uh, this uh, we'll leave for another day. To actually go straight down this thing this looks a little a little nasty and you mentioned earlier there was about uh, an estimated 10,000 ounces which in today's values is that 2 million or 20 million dollars I think it's 20 million dollars yeah I'm not good 15 million 20 <laughs> I'm not good with zero yeah yeah add, but, add them up so but, someone on YouTube will tell us yeah, but, but it, it'll pay it was a significant operation right. e even at today's and uh, the ore that I've tested here has, has come back uh, pretty consistent between a, a quarter to a half ounce per ton gold okay. with a minor silver fraction. So uh, at that, that average, uh, uh, you could probably sustain an underground operation, but you'd certainly hope you could find an ore body that was either uh, richer or had a lot more volume than these uh, small <laughs> Yeah, three, two, three feet is hard to mine at, at a quarter to a half, but yeah. five, six is it would make it a lot easier. You need that volume to get the tonnage going. Right. Well, yeah, let's get our let's get our ladder and okay. we'll go do a little exploring. So here's our access, huh? We're going in here. But you know, I go. Wait a minute. There are multiple quartz veins here, and this is one of them. And then there's the other. That would increase your time ability, but you can have separate, you know, mining activities. Here. Sure. So this, there's a little minor one right here, over right over our head that you were mentioning. Right. So they they were working yeah. multiple zones here. shoulders oh yeah it's yeah can i because you want me to go in front of you no, no, I'm, I'm you're okay. all right okay. this is about the worst spot right there until we get to the ladder yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
But here's where I want to put the ladder. Okay. Well, what the hell? Somebody. Oh, they've got. <laughs> I don't know if I did that. Or, or is this the. I'm glad you got your light there. Well, anyway. I think this might be it, but I but I measured the distance and it was 17 feet down there, so I know we've got enough. Okay. And we still go that way too. And you've never been down to I've, that I've level. I've never been down there. Yeah. Okay. So. Well, that's our first. I might have. Might have put that board in there. Yeah, I forget. Well, you want to haul it out and put the ladder in there? That might be the best. See if we can squeeze down yeah, through there. Just easier. Okay. If you don't mind. No, I'll, let me go get the ladder. We'll see if we okay, can get this. Okay, yeah. So you're using a little infrared. Yeah. This, this one, I've got... Yeah. I don't know. I hit my hand or something. But yeah, if you're trying to measure across a stope or a something, it's a whole lot easier to use that than a tape. And we just got our ladder in here. To me, and I'm standing at the at the hole here. Well, I'll go down here first and see what it's like, okay. and raise it up for you. Do that. Yep, I'm fine with it. I'm down the ladder here, and we're in a little stope. But Lane's gonna come down from there in a minute. He's gonna map this out as we go. I do, yeah. Did you bring your sampling jug? Yeah. Okay, good. Here's a better look at this vein they were working. And they left these little pillars so the whole wall didn't come falling in on them. But then down here in this little stope, they took the vein because that's where the gold was. Let's see what's going on here with Lane. A little pillar right above him there. The veins, the veins less than a foot wide. Really? Yeah. Right above you there. Yeah. This might not have been their main vein, you know. Yeah. Right. Looks like they backfilled here. Yeah. Montero, Burma, I guess. Yeah, we made it. Hopefully this goes somewhere. Tell me about your stylish socks there. Well, they're sort of a, a high visibility white. <laughs> In case I need to find my crooked little body down here. <laughs> if the vest doesn't work, it's the socks that'll right, save you. Right, the socks will definitely. I got mine tucked in for ticks, but I, I like your your high vis socks yeah, better. Yeah, yeah, they're one look at this and the ticks go the other way. <laughs> Wait a minute. Put that in. Okay. Are we at a impasse? I think it keeps going up there. Yeah, I think you're right. Let me scramble up here and see what we got. Okay. And get a sampling face. That could be tough. Yeah. There's there's the vein right above me here. Yeah. And it looks like there's a little bit of copper show, but okay. not a whole lot of mineralization. It looks like it may have gotten faulted off right there. Yeah. Let me, let me see what if we got something going on over here. Yeah, we're we're uh, we're pretty much done over here. There's a, well, it goes up to a little stope there. But I bet we can get a sample off of here. Here's here's B13. It looks like somebody sampled. We got a spot here we're going to take some samples of. It looks like someone else has already done that with the pink here, you see. But we're going to double that up. And when you're taking samples for assay of a vein, it's really important to get from one wall. This, this is a foot wall all the way across to the hanging wall as equally as you can. 
you don't want to come in here and see a bunch of shinies and, and assay a little pocket here. Um, but we might actually do both. We'll, we might take one across the whole face and then see if we can juice one right in here in this good section and see if we can kind of isolate where the gold's hanging out. But you can see the, the vein isn't uh, evenly mineralized all the way across. It's kind of white quartz here. There's a real nice band in the middle that looks like it has most of the sulfides. And then it goes all the way to the hanging wall here where there's not much else. So we'll uh, see if I can get the camera set up and watch me take a sample of this. You want to you want to take one across the whole thing or juice one or both? Ah, uh, let's do both. Okay. Just like you said. Okay. And Jason is taking a representative sample that's going to be as accurate as possible, getting as much representative rock from that vein without bias as best you can. Okay, is that enough for you? That should be uh, actually, more? yeah. Let's let's you know when you fill it up, it's just about exactly that, okay. that bag right there. Yeah, I'll do. A, I'll get another. If you can, I mean, I I think it's it's pretty well oxidized. Okay, so it, it is a little friable. So okay, it's just pretty easy. Yeah. And and the bigger the sample, the more representative it usually is. Perfect. Is that good? Yeah, yeah. Uh, You've made wages. Okay. <laughs> I feel that. important now. Yeah. And that uh, that's an old milk carton that uh, if you fill it, it's the exact contents of that sample bag. And it's actually pretty useful for taking chip samples from mines and such. It's really hard to hold a bucket or anything else up there, a bag, and try and chip into it. But yeah. this is... This, yeah, is, yeah. this is the way to go. Yeah. You've sold me on these. These are great. <laughs> okay, we got our samples across here. We got one all the way across. We got another one of this kind of juicy area right in here. And then after I took that first sample, we found a real nice piece of free gold in a rock right about here. Just, just to the right side of this little seam here. There's, a, there's kind of a band of sulfides. And there's a really nice little piece of gold, free gold right about right about in here. We'll get you get it out in the sun. And you guys can take a look. But we've knocked off a bunch more rock right here in this juicy spot, and we're going to take it out in the sunlight and see what we can see in it. I just came across there. It doesn't go back very far here, Lane. I'll, I'll uh, if you want to throw me a sample bag or something, I can get a sample uh, if I find a spot. I came across this ladder. We're on. We're above where we got our good sample. You can see the vein running there. Some old stalls and stuff. This actually, actually, this little okay, this little hole right here was where I was under and got that nice gold specimen. The vein's actually really well defined, but it's pretty narrow back here. And they chased it for a little ways. I'm assuming they chased it, hoping it would kind of balloon out again to a mineable width. But right now it's uh, nine inches, maybe. And they were drifting along here, hoping. And then it just kind of went down to very little there. And it's not, I mean, even here it's not very mineralized. Pretty much just white quartz. See, here's the face they stopped at. It's just six inches, maybe five, and uh, pretty much barren, barren looking quartz. So that's where they quit on this one. Ow. Let me see if we can find a spot here. 
I don't know if I got it in another video, but right, right here, where I got that good sample, there's a fault. Right here. There's the vein. And it faults off here. Here's the fault right, right here. And so the vein here is about three feet over. See the vein goes here and then it jogs over about three feet. And a lot of times when you have veins or structures that the veins intersect, you'll get some higher grade material. And so that's, that's what I'm assuming happened right here. And right in here, you can see a lot more of the sulfides come back. You're starting to get more mineralization. Some of the copper staining we saw down below, but the farther away you get from the fault, it goes barren. So I will try taking a sample right in here, which is again, right above where I got that good sample. We'll see what it comes back for assay. Well, I just drug the ladder back over. So now our hole is open again, but I survived my Indiana Jones experience with crossing the, the hole here. I didn't have to use my whip. Look at this, they even put a stall in there. I could have used my whip to get across, but I use a ladder just for safety. That hole goes down about 25 feet, I think we measured. But we got two samples back there, so I'm excited to see what comes of this stuff. I'm going to try and get this on camera, but we're looking through a hand lens here. And all that yellow stuff is gold. And it wraps around here. There's a bunch of fine stuff in the quartz. Really, really small. And I don't know if this is in focus or not. But I hope you can see, see that gold there. There's a little streak of pyrite, that dark black stuff. It's just down below that couple blobs and it's all throughout the streak as well right here in the corner there's gold all through there that was that was where I chipped that off underground and got that good sample so hopefully that comes out really really nice well we're back in some different workings here this is kind of a famous tunnel in the area and this goes back, it's supposed to go back about 6,000 feet. And it cross-cut a number of veins on the way back. But it's been concreted up, and no one's been back here in a long time. I've got an air meter with me. So I got that going. We're on a little adventure here. I don't know where this goes or what's back here. I've got laying out at the entrance. It obviously angles up a little bit because I'm running out of water here. It's gonna be in the dry before I know it. And we're just gonna go back here and see what we can see. There we go, not bad. We're out of the water. Looking back at the hole there, we're probably 300 feet in maybe, 200 feet in. Had some nice ties in here. The rail is all gone. That's, that was valuable stuff. They had what they call their piss ditch over here to drain the water out. This is probably a 10 by 10 or a 12 by 12 drift or cross cut, I guess, technically is the term. They were going in here to intersect a bunch of veins. 
that outcropped on the surface. Let me check my air meter here. We're at 20.4. 20, 20 so we're still, we've still got lots of air. And yeah, who knows how long it's been since someone's been back here. And what do we got here? We got our first got our first little cross cut. Looks like there was a little seam here. They were working. I don't see anything fantastic. Here they went up a little bit, chasing it, seeing what they could find. That just goes back. Well, there's, they just went all over in here. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Out here with all the long grass and got my allergies going. So there's there's one, there it is. There's a little quartz quartz seam there. And they followed it back the other way. Ooh, there's a hole. A <laughs> little hole. Full of water though. Don't want to disturb that. Here's about as much water's flowing through here. I don't know. Not very much. Couple gallons a minute, maybe. But the back looks real nice, real competent. So we've gone through one cross cut. There's supposed to be like 30 or something crazy in this tunnel, 35. There's the there's the daylight. Maybe five, six hundred feet back. I got something up ahead here in the drift. This is pretty cool being back here. I like that I can just walk in. Here's a good exposure of country rock. It looks like some kind of maybe metamorphosed sedimentary rock with little quartz stringers in it. But this thing's been open for over 100 years and you don't see any big donagers down here on the floor. Nothing's falling off the back or the ribs. Looks like it's in pretty good shape. We'll get up here to this barrel or air tank and check our air meter again. Now they got ties going all the way across. So that's kind of interesting. There's there's where the, the rails were. I don't know what's going on over here. It doesn't look like they had any nails there. So it doesn't look like there are any rails on that side, but I don't know. More quartz exposed. Here's a big tank. Let me check my air meter again here. Nineteen point eight. So we're down a little bit. We're still okay. But I doubt I'll be able to get to the back today, all the way to the end. There's some, see all that stuff's just oozing down the wall, that's real common. The water's leaching stuff and precipitating it in the walls. Here's the water flow. Not a ton, but it's flowing. So I'm probably a thousand feet, at least by now. And we're 
we're still doing okay. Here's our second cross cut off to the right or the east. Go down here a little ways. What were they chasing here? Here's a vein. Here's a little vein they were chasing. Tiny little thing. Well, I don't know. It, it, it opens up here a little bit. That's maybe a two foot face there. Well, look at that. Now it's three feet. But there's definitely a showing there for sure. It's hard to tell from down here. There's definitely some rust on it. A little bit of mineralization. But I'm guessing it doesn't run very good because it looks like they stopped right there about 50 feet from here. Maybe a total of 70 feet off the main crosscut tunnel. But they didn't, uh, they didn't stope up here. So I bet the grade isn't as, isn't any good or worth it back in the day. And they didn't follow it at all to the west. Okay, now we're back in the main drift. There's the portal. Now we're going back north here. What do we got coming up here? Here's a something. What is this? A little bucket or a barrel? Okay, that was three off to the left there. Starting to get some brown Gucci stuff coming off the wall here. No footprints in that. The fourth cross cut. We got quartz there. A little bit going across. But I'm at 19%, so I'm turning around. There's another barrel up there. That's the second barrel. It gives you an indication of how far I made it. There's the portal. Probably 1,500, maybe 2,000. If this thing is going off, let me get back into the a good air here. All right guys, well I wanted to wrap this video up. I wanted to let you know I made it out of the mine alive. Even though my air meter was going off, I made it out. And uh, luckily I have the assay results from the samples we took. So the first two samples that I took were down on that, that lower section and the assay all the way across the vein came back 11 ounces a ton in gold. The one that I juiced, where I took that sliver right out of the middle with all those sulfides, came back at 21 ounces a ton in gold. And then I took the one right above me there at, through that hole where I had to cross the ladder. That one was five and a half ounces a ton. And then I took another one further uh, closer to the portal on that section of vein, and it came back at two ounces a ton. So that thing is absolutely chocked full of gold. Those are amazing, amazing assay results. So I'm glad I got those assay results. I could put them in the end of this video. And uh, I'm excited to get back in that mine, man. It's a long drive for me. But with gold samples like that, I'm going to go back underground sometime, get a big old sample of ore, and bring it back up to my shop and crush it up through the system. But I'm really excited to see on a future video what that ore from the ore bin pulls out to be. Because if I was getting samples underground at multi-ounce stuff, maybe that stuff in the ore bin is super hot too. Here's our rocks, we got our 10 bags here. I'm gonna be running it through these three pieces of equipment here. This is a six by 10 jaw crusher, a 16 by 12 hammer mill, and a four by eight shaker table. The jaw crusher is gonna crush the samples down into a, a gravel size, half inch or three quarter inch minus. I'm gonna carry them up, put them in this hammer mill here. It's gonna crush them down to a fine powder. I add water in there. 
there's a bunch of hammers that spin around and then there's a screen that goes around the bottom 180 degrees of that mill and as that stuff crushes it turns into a nice slurry falls down this chute into our distributor trough as that shaker table shakes the stuff comes out onto the shaker table the dense gold silver and sulfides fall down into these grooves into this little uh, depression here and they work their way across the table this way up under that water bar and down into the number one and number two concentrates the shaker table is designed there's a little bit of a slope built into the shaker table starting about here and ending right at the end of these four grooves so the quartz once it even in the grooves it can't climb that ramp and so they start falling down into the tailings trough the sulfides can climb the ramp but they can't climb the ramp once they get out of the groove. So as they come up the grooves, they come out at the end of these grooves and they start making a band of sulfides down into the number three middlings here. And only the gold, silver, and the densest material can work its way up these long grooves onto the cleaning plane where this water bar here washes the lighter stuff off and it should leave a nice line of gold and only the densest stuff that goes down into the number one and number two. So hopefully we've got some gold in our rocks that we'll be able to see on the shaker table today. The water for the system is supplied by these two pumps right here. There's a green hose that goes to the shaker table and one that goes up to the hammer mill. The whole system uses about eight to 10 US gallons a minute. And as the water comes down, flows down into the number three and the number four trough, the water and the tailings settle out into the buried tank here. And the water is continuously recirculated through the system over and over again. The whole system is run by a three-phase generator. The jaw crusher here and the hammer mill are both run by the three-phase power. The shaker table is run by single-phase 120 volt power, just like you plug into your wall at home. We do have an option for the jaw crusher and the hammer mill to be run by gas motors, Honda gas motors, and the shaker table can be powered by a small 110 generator as well as the pumps. So you can run this system in remote locations with gas power. And a lot of people ask, do we sell this equipment? We absolutely do. You can check out our website and uh, that we have some pricing on there. We have some a lot more information about each one of these pieces of equipment. So if you're interested, check out our website. We got all our buckets here. I got everything weighed. There's 250.3 kilograms in this stuff. And this stuff went through the crusher. You can see these are the bigger rocks. That's about the size. But a lot of the ore bin finds, I actually don't need to crush. The hammer mill will take up to about a two inch rock. And so all these bigger pieces, those can go right in the hammer mill. And one of the reasons I mentioned that is because if you have tailings, if you have stuff that's already fine, you may not even need a jaw crusher. You can get this stuff and just put it right through the hammer mill. Um, also for developing countries, a lot of times they mine by hand and they don't get very many big pieces. And the ones that they do, they can just break up into smaller pieces with a hammer. So in some situations, you might not need a jaw crusher and you can just put it right in the hammer mill and right down onto a shaker table.
Well, we're just finishing up the run now. I've run all the stuff. The heron mill shut off. We'll come up and take a look at the table here. Looks like I got a little piece of copper wire in there. There's a bunch of little copper balls, which doesn't matter. Those will smelt out. And I heard a few times I must have put a big nail or a nut or something in the hammer mill because it was... There's the hammers winding down. Because it was banging around, steel in there banging around, and then it just kind of went away. Um, so I wasn't too worried about the tramp iron because the hammer mill can take it. But there's a little bit of gold here right at the leading edge of this blue line. I think that blue line is Galena. And then there's pyrite right behind it. And the gold is hanging out right just ahead of the Galena. It's really a clean ore. There's, there's not very many sulfides. Most of the sulfides are coming across these top three grooves, a little bit out of the fourth groove, but hardly any are making it down into the middlings. Took about half an hour to run the sample, but I was screwing around filming and checking on the table and stuff, so. We're probably averaging right around three quarters of a ton or a ton an hour if you're gonna run continuously. And we turned 250 kilograms. I don't know, it's hard to tell here. We'll see when we get out, but there's not very much in there. Number two usually has two or three times as much as the number one cons. But we'll get the table cleaned off here and see what we got. We'll smelt this stuff down into a bead and get her weighed. So at the end of a run I always brush down the table because sometimes you get some gold and stuff hung up in these grooves at the very end. So you just brush everything out and usually you get a pretty good showing of gold. There's not a whole lot here. I mean obviously there's some gold you can see at the yellow but I wanted to show you how fine it was. It's just 200, 300 mesh you probably, some of these bigger pieces down here you could, but you probably couldn't see these pieces down here by my finger if there wasn't a pile of them. They're that small. And then you can see the bigger, some of that copper wire stuff coming out there, but 
There's some gold in there, which is good. It's a little bit, uh, I don't know what to call it, l l white than some of the gold I've seen. So there's probably some silver mixed in. That might be 80% gold and 20% silver. And also I'm expecting when we smelt this stuff down, oftentimes galena will carry some silver with it. So we might have some silver in our bead, but we'll turn the tail back on, get it all brushed down into the number one cons and smelt it. All right, we got our stuff here. Here's the number one. Came up to a, a little a little bit past four ounces on this jug. And you can see in there, it's just all sulfides. We'll get a weight on it. It's probably half a kilogram or so. So there's our number one. Our number two is pretty much full right to the top there. So we'll get a weight on him as well. That's mostly sulfides there. So we can get we can get a weight on that. And we'll, we might do a little smelt on that, see if there's anything in there. And then the number three is pretty much just quartz. There might be a, a few little sulfides in there. You could rerun that on the table and through the hammer mill if you wanted to clean it up and recover a little bit more sulfides out of there, but it's really mostly just quartz. There's not a whole lot going on there. Now, typically what we found with this stuff is the number one concentrates contain about 95, 90 to 95% of the free gold. The number two contains the last five to 10%. And the stuff that's in the middling fraction is still either bonded to sulfides or you haven't ground it fine enough to liberate the gold. So the table does a really good job if the gold is liberated, getting into the number one and a little bit into the number two. And just like with the number three middlings, you can always run the number two concentrates back on the table and clean up quite a bit of that free gold that might, might be in here and get it into the number one. So you can rerun your number two and number three back through the system. So at the end of the day, you're only dealing with your number one concentrates, which as you can see, we turned 250 kilograms into, I don't know, maybe uh, 250 grams, 500 grams, somewhere in there. So I think that's a concentration ratio of about 500 or 1,000 to 1. Well, here's our number one. We got 550 grams. That cup weighs about 30 grams, and there's probably 20 grams of water left in there. So we're right at 500 grams of concentrates. All right, what we have here is the number one concentrates. And this is how I like to do it. I, I like to take the number one, pan it down. It gets you a visual on how much gold there is. But also, if there's a bunch of gold, you can suck it out and put it in the cupel furnace and get a bead right away. I mean, you don't have to screw around with smelting it. You don't have to worry about losing it in the mat. You don't have to handle it anymore. You can just suck out that free gold and recover it. The other thing it does for you is if you can suck out that free gold and get it out all the sulfide stuff, I'm still going to smelt down the panning tailings here. And if I, for example, if I get the free gold out of here and I get five grams of free gold out of this, and then I turn around and I smelt these panning tailings, which is the number one concentrate without the free gold in them, and I end up with 0.2 grams, it's probably not worth it for me to smelt down the cons it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy. Whereas if I can recover 95% of that stuff by just panning, sucking it out with a, a little snuffer bottle and cupelling it, then I can take these panning tailings and put them through the hammer mill, put them through the table again and uh, recycle it through the system. So I'm not spending hours and hours smelting stuff down, screwing around, spending a bunch of time and a bunch of extra cost where I can recover a huge percentage really fast and I can get back to milling. I don't want to be sitting here smelting and panning all day. I want to be running high grade raw virgin stuff through the hammer mill and be getting more gold. So that's what we're going to do here. And again, this is, this is like a proof of concept. This is a sample. We're going to see how much gold we can recover, how much gold's in the concentrates, and then we can make a decision on how we want to proceed if we were going to process this ore in the future. Well, here's the number one. And there's not a ton of gold in there. I mean, there's some gold, but there's a there's a little gold bead right there that probably 25% of the whole gold in the whole pan is in that little bead. 
Okay, let's see if we can get this on camera here. So I've got my gold in there. I've just got a normal snuffer bottle. I'm gonna take the snuffer bottle and suck up as much of that gold as I can. And try and keep it clean. You don't you can't get a whole bunch of sulfides or else the cupellation process won't work. So now I can take this and get another go at it here. And try and keep some of that copper in the pan. It's not gonna hurt us too bad. Because it'll just oxidize out when we oxidize away the lead we're gonna use. So I might use bismuth for this one. There you go, that's pretty good. Let's see if I can get one more in there. Get as much gold out of there as we can. Get it all bumped over to the edge here. Oh man, there's hardly any, any left there. I'm not even gonna worry about that little bit. Can you see that in there? Man, it's super fine in the shade. Super, super fine little gold in there. So we'll get that smelted down and that'll come out in our little button. But most of our gold's in here, and I'll show you how I get that out. So here we got our little shop towel, little paper towel, toilet paper works, whatever. And I got my snuffer bottle. I'm going to turn it over. I pulled the straw out, shake everything down to the little cone, down to the little tip here. And then carefully drip the gold down into that paper towel. And we're gonna make a little gold gold packet, a little gold a little gold pouch out of this paper towel. Okay, so we got our gold in there. And it really helps out if you can keep it concentrated. If you get gold spread out all over the place, it's kind of a pain. Now I'm going to take some bismuth. This is just crushed up bismuth. I'm going to add it right on top of the gold there. Oh, that's probably good. So now I've got our bismuth in there. Now I can take this whole thing. and carefully squeeze out some of the water. I guess I usually squeeze the water out before I add the bismuth or the collector metal. So that's all in there. Now I can take some scissors, tin snips actually, and cut off all that paper towel. There we go. Now I got my gold and my bismuth right there. Now we're going to take a cupel and I'm going to get it heated up to about 1750, 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm going to put that gold and bismuth in there like that. It's going to melt the bismuth, melt the gold. It's all going to alloy together in a molten puddle. The paper is going to burn off, and then I open the furnace door and let a little bit of oxygen in there, and the oxygen reacts with the molten bismuth, The mol if there's any lead in there from the galena, if there's any iron in there from the nails and the bolts and stuff, it's going to react and form an oxide, so it'll be bismuth oxide, lead oxide, all that stuff. This cupel is impervious to liquid metal, but it soaks up oxides like a sponge. And so that molten bottle, mo that molten button or molten puddle 
gets a film of oxides on the top, and then the oxides roll off, and as soon as they touch the cupel, they get absorbed, sucked into the cupel. So you have a continuous oxidation process happening, and as that button gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the precious metals, the gold and silver, will not oxidize even at 1,750 degrees Fahrenheit. So at the very last little bit, once that last little bit of base metals get sucked out or oxidized, sucked into the cupel, then you're left with a precious metal button sitting in the cupel in the furnace. You can pull it out, cool it down, weigh it, and that's all your precious metals from our sample. All right, it's always a good idea to heat up your cupels. So I always get those warm first. Here's our little gold packet. Our paper towel is drying out there, burning off. And once that bismuth gets up to temperature, it'll melt into a little molten puddle, absorb all that gold, and then we'll check back in a couple minutes and you, hopefully you can see the little droplets of oxides on that surface that are gonna roll in and absorb into that cupel. All right, we'll check here on our Cupel. There's the bismuth. I don't know if you can see it. Little black droplets forming on the surface there and rolling off into that sponge cupel. The black ring around the metal button is where the oxides have been absorbed. It changes the color. So we'll let that go for a little while and when it's all said and done, we'll have a little prill of precious metals. All right, we're gonna try a couple different things this time. I'm gonna heat up my crucible super hot before I put anything in it. In the past, I've done it cold, and it seems like it boils more and I get more froth when I add my flux and sulfides to a cold crucible and heat it up slowly. I've mixed up my stuff here. I have 500 grams of sulfides, 800 grams of soda ash, 200 grams of silica sand, and I added about 50 grams of lead oxide as a collector metal. So I'm gonna shake that all up. What I need to do is I need to add iron into that. I'm actually gonna add it into the crucible here. The iron will reduce the lead, reduce all the other base metals to metallic form, and it will absorb all the sulfides. The sulfides that's formed with the iron is FES, which will be soluble. It will be dissolved in our basic slag we're going to make. I'm not going to add the iron until it's completely melted because I also think that the iron might cause it to froth as well. So the two things I'm going to try is heat it up first and add iron after it's all melted and see if I can prevent some of that boiling because this soda ash, when you have a large concentration of soda ash, you're going to get a lot of boiling and frothing and that's what we don't want. So I'm gonna try those two things. We'll see how it goes.
Well, things have cooled down a little bit, and here's all the iron that I have left over. And I don't know if you could see when I put them in, but I put in a bunch of nails and those big spikes and stuff. And so we got a bunch of iron eating up. Here's our pour. Let's see what we got. There's the lid at the bottom. That's a good sign. And there's our little lead prill. I beat it into kind of a cube shape uh, to knock off as much slag as we could. So we'll do the same thing. We'll put that in our Cupel furnace, see how much precious metals we have. All right, let's see what we got here. Oh yeah, nice, nice little bead. Let's see if we can get it out of there, hold on. Yeah, that's, a, that's an appreciable bead there. Let's get it over next to our other one. We'll get them weighed and see what we got. Well, here's our two beads. That's the stuff that I sucked out and that's the sulfides that I smelted down. So let's get them on the scale and see what we got. First one is 0.97 grams, so almost a gram. Second one is 0.675. So about two thirds of the first one, but an appreciable amount of gold. So in this ore, I can tell you right away that we need to smelt down the concentrates and there's no reason to suck out the gold. If you're going to get that much more, you might as well just leave it all in there and do one smelt. So there they are together, a little over half a gram. And it looks like the first one is a little bit more yellow. The one we did the sulfide smelt on is a little bit more white, so there's probably some more silver in there. But based on the color, you're looking at 75 or 80 percent gold by weight there. So let's do some math. Well, here are the results. We started with 250 kilograms. We got 1.645 grams of gold beads, precious metals. We're going to multiply that by 0.8 to figure out how much uh, gold we have in them based on the color. Ended up with 1.3 grams of gold. When you convert that, you get five, a little over five grams per metric ton of gold. And there's that many grams in a troy ounce. So it's 0.17 troy ounces per metric ton. At five grams per metric ton, it'd be probably pretty hard to make a profit mining that underground. But if you had a pile of it sitting on the surface, you could probably make that pay if all you had to do was scoop it up and run it through a system to recover the gold. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I'm gonna be going back to that location here in a couple of weeks. So stay tuned for that video. We're gonna go after some of that super high grade we found underground. If I can get 500 pounds of multi-ounce stuff, that would be really cool to run through that system. So stay tuned for that video. But again, I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the next one.